have you ever thought about, think about something just for a second, what it takes to really amaze you? Think about that while you're watching the video. Myself, I love to see a good magic trick. Does anybody, anybody like magic tricks? I, I would love to see a good magician. And, and, I, and I could usually walk away, you know, they had one on, anybody ever watch America's Got Talent? A guy named Shin Lim, an Asian guy. He did some card tricks that were just amazing. And I, I can walk away from that and say, I was amazed how in the world even though I knew it was a trick, I knew that there was something to it, I was still just amazed. How in the world did he do that? I lived in, in Wyoming. I, I saw some things that were pretty amazing. Anytime you can see hot water spurting up out of the ground, I, you know, I kind of call that amazing. I got to go elk hunting, even though I didn't kill an elk when I, when I went. But we climbed up on this mountain and and went kind of about halfway up on horseback and then halfway up walking. And, and I'd venture to say that, you know, as difficult as it was for this old man to, to reach the top of the mountain, there probably weren't just a whole lot of people that had stood up there and, and stood where I, I was at that day. And, and the view was just, just breathtaking. I mean, you could just see for miles and miles and miles. And, 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 and I'd have to say that was pretty amazing. Another thing that always amazes me is kids. Anybody else amazed by kids? And, uh, I'll tell you what we were always talking about. We were laughing about this the other day. You know, and I'm as guilty as anybody else. I had kids that I spent way too much on and birthdays and Christmas and stuff like that. And you got this little kid that doesn't really understand what it's like and you buy this expensive gift for on Christmas. And this has actually happened to us. And, and, and you get down there and, and they get the package open and you get the toy out. And you look around five minutes later and the kid is playing with the wrapping paper. That's pretty amazing to me. Spent a hundred bucks on this, whatever it was, and the kid's over here playing with the box and the wrapping paper. That's pretty amazing. Now, now, say I've seen a whole lot of amazing things in my life. It probably wouldn't be true, but I guess I've seen a few things. I'm going to talk about a guy this morning that saw something that was pretty, pretty amazing. The prophet Daniel saw a vision of God. So if you want to go along with us this morning, if, you, if you'd like to turn to a Bible, uh, you can turn to the seventh chapter of Daniel. We're going to read just a couple of verses. Daniel had a vision of God. Now we can all have dreams. And, and I've seen some pretty scary things 
in my time in my dreams. I don't dream a lot, but you know, when, when, when you have that sixth taco right before bed, you can see some pretty wild things. And it wasn't good either. But we usually we usually blame it on, you know, I had a big meal, you know, something went a little haywire in the digestive system, and, and then you have this 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 terrible dream. But what if you had a vision where you saw God Himself? Last week we talked about we talked about recognizing people and recognizing Jesus. And we looked at Jesus in light of some of his I am statements. And through that we might see him better for who he is. This week I want to try to do a little bit of the same thing with God the Father. If I ask you this morning, I want everybody, this is a mental exercise. Close your eyes. Close your eyes and create for yourself a mental picture of what God looks like. Everybody got one? You can open your eyes now because I I was a little bit scared of that because I thought somebody might nod off. But uh, but you've got that mental picture in your mind of what God looks like. All right, now I'm going to try to guess and see if it's something similar to mine. First off, he's old. We know that, right? He, he, he's this old guy. You know, he's got a big gray beard and he's got white hair. Oh, kind of like Robert. Uh, <laughs> well, you don't have the long flowing white robe. You, know, you don't have the, you don't have that. You know, he's got on this long flowing white robe. How do you think we came up with that picture? Was it after a spicy meal? No. no probably not. We probably came up with that picture in the beginning because of Scripture, like we're about to read. That gives us a version. A version of God. Well, how we could picture God if we were going to picture Him. So. Scripture I'm going to read to you is from the book of Daniel. It's in the beginning of this prophecy section. Probably no other book has as much mystery surrounding it as the book of Daniel. There, there are passages in this book that still have scholars arguing over with each other and trying to figure out what he was meant and you know, all that thing. But I want to read to you from chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, where Daniel talks about his vision of God. He says, I watched as thrones were put in place and the Ancient One sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session. And the books were opened. This passage is in the, in the middle of Daniel's vision about the four beasts. To me, it, it kind of seems almost out of place, you know, where it occurs. In, in my research on this passage, I never really found a good, clear explanation about why it was included at this point, except to illustrate the power of God over these beasts that were destroying the world. Now, most scholars agree that these beasts represented different countries or nations that were a threat to the nation of Israel. Depending on which scholar you read, it could be Greece, it could be Rome, Babylonia, Persia. It just depends. 
So I don't think I'm going to venture down into too deep into, into what that really means. I just want to talk about what what Daniel saw in his vision when he looked and he saw a glimpse of God. And what that glimpse of God should mean to us. First, if we look at God, we should see perfection. If you notice what's prevalent in Daniel's description of God, physical features, if you will, it's the color white. White is always known as the color of purity. Psalm 51 7. When, Dan, when David was re repenting after committing adultery with that sheep, he said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Does anybody know what hyssop is? Well, hyssop is this, this plant that, that's pretty common over in the Middle East and, and it belongs to the mint family. And you'll, you'll see it a, a, a two or three times in the Bible mentioned. Um, if you remember, we took a hyssop plant and painted the doorpost with blood and the Passover when Jesus was on the cross for the sponge this of stalk. All those things have to do with cleanliness. Uh, and we don't know exactly how they used it, but I, I think they used it maybe even in medicinal ways. It was a, a cleansing thing. My mother was a good shopper. She was always looking for a bargain. You ever go into the, to the store and, you know, I, I'm sure like me, you go to Walmart six times a week, it seems like. You, you go, go back there and you look for the clothes or you're looking for something, something like that. If, if you look long enough back there at all the clothes hanging on the rack, you're probably going to find some piece of clothing that's soiled or something wrong with it. Maybe somebody bought it and they wore it for a while and returned it to the store. I've seen that happen before. Maybe it was just hanging on the rack and, and some snotty-nosed kids like mine will walk by and touch every piece of clothing on the rack, you know. Maybe they got candy on their hands or whatever. Maybe it got soiled in shipping. To be honest, there are a lot of ways that the clothing can get dirty before you buy it. But my mother was a hawk or something like this. And she found this article of clothing and she really liked it. And if it had this little spot on it or, you know, a missing thread or whatever, she called the manager of the store and said, well, this, this clothing. And really, honestly, she usually got a pretty good discount on it. And we'd give it to her for... for for a good discount, a good price. You see, just like that clothing, it gets stained sometimes just hanging there. We're all stained. We can never be totally clean. We can never be white without the blood of Jesus to cover our sins. But God in His essence is pure. At the core of His being, God is perfection. God cannot, God will not, God will never exist in the presence of sin. That's why when men have visions of God, He will always be white. He will always be clothed in white or in a white light. Many, many thousands of people, whether you believe in this or not, they, they related near-death experiences. Times when maybe their heart stopped for a certain length of time and they were brought back. And almost universally, they, they relate this as going towards a light. Some, a bright tunnel or a bright light. Every good thing 
Every perfect thing in this world is contained in God the Father. Who when we see Him one day, I'm sure we'll be surrounded by purity. And we may perceive that purity as a color of light. Second attribute of God that we see from, from Daniel is separation. In Psalm 71 12, it says, Oh God, do not be far from me. Oh my God, hasten to my help. I was discussing this with some of the ladies in the Sunday school this, this morning. Daniel talked in his vision about something that separated us from God. It says that he sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire was pouring out flowing from his presence. What do you think about when you see wheels of fire? Let me ask you this question. If you have a box, that's a heavy box, and you want to move it somewhere, what's the easiest way to move it? Put some wheels on it. Why do I need wheels if it's just going to sit in one place, right? When I think about those blazing wheels, I, I think about the chariot. And, and I think about that chariot of fire that picked up Elijah from the earth. So God being on the throne, He sits on this throne with wheels of fire. And, and that indicates that God is not confined to one place. You know, we all like to think that God's in And He lives in our hearts. I know that. He lives in my heart. Modern theology has, in a way, given us the idea that God is present in everything. I don't think God can be present in evil. I don't think if your heart is evil this morning that God can be present there. I think that kind of idea gives us the idea that it gives you an attitude that supports those people to say, well, I don't have to go to church. I, I, I don't have to do that. I, I, can, I can worship. Because God's everywhere, I can worship from my fishing boat. I can, I can worship from my deer stand because God's everywhere. You know, we say He lives in our hearts. He's just present in everything. But actually, that's not the biblical representation of God. What does the psalmist say? Oh God, do not be far from me. If I as a psalmist beg God not to be far away from me, that means that God can be far away from me, right? If he can request that, that must mean that if God has the capability of being present with the person, place, or thing, or he has the capability to withdraw himself from the person, place, or thing. I want to ask you an honest question this morning. I don't know anybody about to shout out answers. But I want you to think about this and think about this in a non-judgmental way. Because every Sunday that you come here feel the same. Does every Sunday feel the same when you come to church? I, I've noticed in my short time here that it's different every week. In fact, every place that I've ever been, it was different week to week. Some weeks I stood down and I just pour my heart and my soul into a message. And you know what? pastor will stick his chest out then to himself at least anyway. Man, I just can't wait for Sunday. Boy, I've got to... Anybody ever watch Family Feud? We play Family Feud. You watch Family Feud every week. Steve Harvey comes out and says, oh, we got a good one for you this week. I kind of want to say that when I get up here. Oh, i got a good one for you this week. And I just can't wait for Sunday to get here. And I think it's going to be so good. We're going to have people fighting over places at the altar. Give the message and it's all over. 
And all I get at the back door is that a bit obligatory good sermon. Good sermon, Pastor. Sure enjoyed that. There's nothing wrong with that. But then the next week, maybe I struggle with a message of the oh man, and I'm almost as scared to give it because it, it, it's I just, I just don't think it's right. I don't think it's up to what I can do. And people come out with tears in their eyes. How do you explain that? Why do you think that is? Well, let me tell you what it's not. It's not anything to do with me. Because if it was something to do with me, that great sermon that I'd written the week before would cause a revival. We'd be having to increase the parking lot by now. The difference was the Lord showed up in your life that day. Now I'd like to say that He shows up here every week, but you, but you all know not in the same way. And not for every one. Because we come in here, we got stuff on our mind. We got jobs to do, we got bills to pay, we got sickness, we got this, and we got that. They don't show up in the same way. God the Father can grant His presence in our lives, but He can just as easily remove it. Last attribute we see from Daniel is sovereignty. Isaiah 46, 9, 10. Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass for I do whatever I wish. Our scripture in Daniel says a river of fire was flowing from His presence. It says millions of angels ministered to Him. Many millions stood to attend Him. Then the court began its session and the books Many people look at this passage in chapter 7 on the, uh, in Daniel and say, oh, that's an end times prediction. And, and it does resemble some of the writings in the book of Revelation. But most scholars maintain the idea that this prophecy refers to a, to a time when the world would be threatened by great, by great powers or nations. But the supreme power of God would always reign over it. The river of fire indicates not only a purifying, but also a separation, such that God has separated Himself from the evil present in the earth. Likewise, the vision containing the, the court of angels with the millions and millions of, of angels in attendance gives a, a, a visual picture of the, the supremacy of God. But maybe the most telling information on the ultimate outcome is when Daniel mentions the, the, the court. The court's beginning its session, the opening of the books. I, I've read that many kings kept writings about the, the things that they did during their reign. They wanted to keep a written record of what they accomplished. And, and they would have the books brought out and, and from time to time read aloud. So either for their own hearing and their own enjoyment or or so that other people might be enlightened on what the king accomplished. When the books were open and the accounts of these evil nations were read, then God would pass His judgment. And it's very clear from His writing who would prevail. No matter how you view this passage, if you view this passage and associate it with end times prophecy or you believe it was written for a, for a people who would soon experience those four beasts as, as evil nations. There's only one important thing that matters. Evil as it refers to a nation or a people will come and go. 
one will rise, and the other will fall. But in the end, there's only one that will last. Only one who will be the judge and the king of all. God himself will, will gaze upon the works of the nations and the works of his children, and he will have the final say. His word, his decision, will always be just and be final. In 2 Corinthians 4 6, it says, For God, who said, Let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts. So we could know the glory of God in the seen in the face of Jesus. The only way that we'll truly ever see God and ever know God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. The only way that we could ever be allowed in His presence was because of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. But even though he, he saved us from our sin, even though this was done on our behalf, there's still some responsibility that falls on us. We still have an obligation. We have an obligation to know and to love God. We have an obligation to seek the face of God and to know what that face may look like. And the only way that we can do that is to study the Bible, study God's Word. The only glimpse we will have is, is through those who, who, who have chosen, who have been chosen to look upon the face of God before they die. If we know Him, we will love Him. If we seek the good, we will be We need to see from the day. We need to know more, to see more, to be more, to be more in His kingdom. Let me pray today that God will be revealed in the life. 165 is Thank you.